Sword Art Online is the worst show I have ever had the experience of suffering through. Is what I said after watching and reviewing SAO Season 1. Though looking back, my thoughts have changed a bit. I think I was a bit harsh. Not a ton, but a bit. And I had pretty much just written off all of SAO after Season 1, not imagining how I could possibly like anything else the franchise had to offer. But then... I somehow ended up liking Ordinal Scale when I saw it for the second time. And that made me wonder, would I also end up liking Season 2? And I gave it a try a few months ago, and after watching it, I have thoughts on it. I think it's really the perfect series to review. As you can probably see by the length of this video, I have lots of thoughts on it. Something I'm sure you've noticed if you've been around the community for long is how popular the series is and how often videos are made about it. If you exclude episodic content, I would say that SEO is probably the most covered anime on YouTube. And there are a lot of big YouTubers who have gotten their fame because of their videos on SEO, typically bashing it. And every time they make a new video about it, they're accused of just jumping onto the hate train for cash. But really, there is good reason to keep talking about SEO. A spinoff just finished, and Season 3 is airing in a bit, assuming I get this out before Season 3 airs, and there's just so much to talk about with it. Just Season 2, which I'm focusing on today, has so many different ideas, things it tries doing, things it fails at doing, that all could deserve their own video. But today, my focus is to look at all of it and answer the question, is SAO Season 2 good? At least through my subjective tastes, of course. So let's go through the three arcs. Gun Gale Online, Excalibur, and Mother's Rosario. By the way, I'm going to be spoiling pretty much the whole series because I really want to make my points and I need concrete examples to do so. So yeah, I figure if you're interested enough in SEO Season 2, you would have already seen it. And if you haven't, you probably don't care enough to care about spoilers, but there's your warning, so whatever. The first arc, Gun Gale Online, is the arc that this season is known for. In the virtual reality MMO FPS, a player known as Death Gun is shooting people in-game, which causes them to die in real life. Since they supposedly took out the feature in the VR headsets that could kill people, though I would ask why they were even there to begin with, anyway. Because of these people dying after being shot, there is concern. So Kirito is sent into the world of Gungil online to investigate, where he meets the waifu of the arc, Shunyon. This arc is one where... I have mixed feelings about it. Everything was handled really sloppily, though there are a few parts where the show is able to do something great. A lot of times I just felt like they had these ideas, but no one stopped to think if the ideas made any sense. For example, the government official telling Kirito what was going on did it in a cafe. Why would you hold such an important meeting in a cafe? Isn't this the type of information that you would want to keep on a need-to-know basis and hence only have those around who needed to hear it? There were other things in the scene that bothered me too, like how little the government guy knew about GGO. I get that he might not be a big gamer, but a lot of this seems like you could learn with some Wikipedia research. However, there's one point here where the show is able to use its seemingly sloppy writing to its advantage, and that was setting up how Death Gun kills his foes that it wasn't just by shooting them in-game. After the SAO incident, the government would definitely go and crack down on these systems, ensuring that they could not be a danger anymore. So the fact that someone else was killing people via the games just seems stupid. Plus, it felt like they were just trying to rehash the plot from Season 1. But the truth was that the deaths weren't caused by the game at all. And the beauty of the twist is that we were lured to believe SAO would have such bad writing, so we were surprised when it turns out there was another cause to it. Which, if this was a better written show, we would have known there would be another cause to begin with. And I liked how Kirito is raising the questions we had here. How unlikely this all seemed. How there had to be something more. But the sloppy writing is not a good thing about this season. So let's get into a few other examples. One of the plot points brought up is that the Japanese government really can't do anything to the GGO company because they are in America. But if a company is going to register in America, they would have to have an address. And while small games might be able to do something without setting up an official business, something like GGO would need to be registered with the government. 
Plus, if you're hosting a game, you need game servers. Those servers need IP addresses. And in order to get an IP address, you have to register with someone for it. Plus, if there are stories of those being killed in game causing them to die in real life, it only makes sense that America would investigate as well, not to mention the news media basically forcing action because of how much of a thing the SAO incident was. Anything like it would grab a lot of attention. There's also the whole converting between games thing, which didn't really make any sense. It felt like a lame plot device to justify Kirito still being powerful in a game he had never played before. Alfheim and GGO are very different games run by very different companies, so why would it be possible to convert a character in one to another? Really, it was just to let Kirito be OP as here as well. Like, Kirito is good at video games, but he ended up being so much better at the other players here in a game he never played before, and yeah, that's stretching things a bit. It was also pretty obvious throughout the battles that, yes, he is going to win. There is no other narrative path for the story to take, so there wasn't really much tension. And let's get a bit more into his journey into GGO. They had Kirito in a hospital so they could monitor him, which, all well and good, that makes sense. But the nurse the nurse. The nurse started by feeling Kirito up, basically assaulting him, possibly sexual assault, depending on exactly what laws you're going by, and then some lewd comments about him stripping for the electrodes, and yeah, it just all felt extremely creepy, and keep in mind, Kirito is a minor here. A show that is trying to be mostly serious should not be resorting to such trashy and unfunny humor. Like, yes, some shows can make trashy stuff work, but it is because they are trashy shows to begin with. And I hated it when he had something similar happen at the end of season one with Asuna and basically the guy wanting to rape her. And well, yes, it wasn't the same thing here. It still felt similar and I feel hurt the whole thing quite a lot. Then when Kirito got into the game, he was a girl. Because apparently your appearance is random or something, which just doesn't make sense for video games because you tend to want to at least have some character customization. And then, well, in game he met the wife of the arc, Shinyon, who I already mentioned, and Shinyon shows Kirito around how the game worked and all that. And then Kirito is OP during the bullet dodging thing because he's Kirito and he has to be awesome. One of the things that felt really odd was how shocked Shinyon was that Kirito was really a guy, and how she slapped him for him seeing her in her underwear. Because keep in mind, character appearances are random. Therefore, half of the people in this game are the opposite gender of how they are in real life. And then there's also the fact that it doesn't make sense, like why would she don't care when it's her avatar that's being seen in her underwear and not her actual body? Because again, the avatars are random apparently, or maybe not, not random, maybe Kirito is just a girl for no reason. But still, when you are online playing an MMO, you have to assume that a lot of the characters are not the actual gender. Like I have friends and family and even myself who play opposite gender characters from time to time. And then after Kirito is slapped, his character styled a red mark because of course he did. Or she did. I don't know. Another issue I had is how seriously everyone is taking the game of GGO. It's not some life or death game. That was the SAO arc. But it's just a game people play for fun. And it felt like the writers were just assuming this is a standard fantasy type world they were playing in. One example is having the tournament with the characters only having one life. Meaning that whoever got the jump start on the other would likely win despite that being a matter of luck as much as skill. This is why in esports there are typically multiple rounds in a match or characters having multiple lives. For example, for the Super Smash Bros. tournaments they are typically a best of three and each character has two lives per match. So that even if one character is lucky, they do get a lucky hit in, it's not the end of the match. And that's far from the only thing that did not make sense during GGO. And then they also commented how you can't log out during the tournament, which makes absolutely no sense, because if you're going to put your body into basically coma, you need a way to get out should things go bad. Like there's a fire, or a creepy guy about to kill you, or a hundred other reasons I can't think of right now because I'm kind of going off script. Whatever. And then there are a lot of things plot-wise that just happened because the plot needed it to. Like how Shinyon went from tolerating Kirito to looking up for him. Or how the finals of the tournament were the one time where Shinyon did not deadbolt her door. Or how Kirito just happened to have an electrode where he was stabbed, with, which blocked the poison. Or how Kirito remembered a small detail about red eyes in a briefing from years ago in SAO, and the fact that Death Gun had red eyes had to mean it was the same person. Yeah, I think I made my point that the show makes no sense. But if you want more examples, let me know. I have lots of notes. Uh, but for all the bashing I am doing of this arc, it has its good parts too. 
Most of the action during the arc was pretty mediocre, but I really liked the final battle against Deska and how it showed Shinyun and Kirito working together to take him down. Like Shinyun destroying his scope, Kirito getting in close, and then Shinyun using the phantom bullet to basically throw him off, give Kirito the opening that he needed. I really like this because it gave both of the characters a moment to shine here instead of Kirito just winning because he's Kirito and not needing help. And that really is the feeling of a big climactic fight. But for all the focus SAO puts on video games, I actually feel that the most interesting parts of the show are what happens outside of the games. And Shinyun's story is what makes this work so well. We learned that when she was young, she ended up stopping a robbery at a post office by shooting the criminal with his own gun killing him. And this mentally scarred her so much so that she can't look at a gun without freaking out. She plays GGO to desensitize herself to guns, though it's a slow process. And I thought, this is really neat. I also like how they brought back Kirito's time in SAO, with the villain being someone that Kirito fought back then. He was part of a player killer guild, and during the battle against that guild, Kirito had to kill people. And this did bog Kirito down with him having the weight of taking a life on her shoulder. And I think the parallels here between Kirito and Shinyun were really interesting, even if it did feel like Kirito went from being bothered to overt without any real logical development happening. I also like the twist that Shinyun's friend's Kyoji was Death Gun, especially since I called it back in episode 3, but I forgot about that until I went to reread the notes I took for it, and then I appreciated a lot of the foreshadowing leading up to that twist, like the reason that Death Gun had the same type of gun Shinyun used. I especially liked when Kyoji showed up at Shinyun's house after the final battle with Death Gun was over, because that was a way of relieving the tension. Because after the tournament you thought, oh, Death Gun is in Shinyun's house, he's about to kill her anyway. But no one was there, and then Kyoji showed up, and everything was good and calm and happily ever after. But then Kyoji started acting a bit weird. Then he pulled out a syringe, and like Shinyun, you start putting two and two together. This really was the perfect way to go from what seemed like the big climax to the actual final conflict of the arc. This part was able to really show the good that video games can do here. With Shinyun, she was able to start overcoming her fear of guns and also just be a stronger person in general. During the battle against Kyoji in her apartment, Shinyun is encouraged by her avatar to fight too, to protect Kirito in case Kirito gets here and also would be killed by him. Then she gets an awesome fight with Kyoji and it was just like filled with desperation. And yes, Kirito did show up to save her, but Shinyun still delivered the final blow by bashing him in the head with a boombox. Plus, she finally stood up to the bullies and intimidated them with her knowledge of guns, and that was just great, even if afterwards we saw she was at the edge of breaking down and had barely held it together. But still, that shows it was not easy, and that makes for a great victory for her. And we also see the danger of video games from the eyes of the villains, how they can draw people in and make them confuse the fictional world with reality when taken too far. For a show that is targeted to gamers, this is an important message, and while they can be used for fun or even help people, there is a danger to video games that need to also be considered. And then the final thing I liked about this arc was the resolution to Shinyun's story here, where she meets the worker at the post office that she saved by killing the robber. All throughout the arc, both Shinyun and Kirito felt the weight of those they had killed. But this ending showed that there is another side to what they did, that while they may have killed someone in doing so, they saved lives. While this is a logical answer, we could say that they killed for the greater good, that does not diminish the weight of killing that should be upon them. And I like that it took so long for the show to give us this answer so we could really feel that weight. And this was able to balance both the weight of the action, but also the good that it leads to. And I just felt that was the wonderful way to wrap up her story. So in the end, is GGO a good arc? It has its great parts but also a share of problems, so I'd say they kind of balance each other out. So the arc is kind of close to like a 5 out of 10 average. Which is kind of sad because as I got to the end, I saw how good it could have been, but it wasn't, sadly.
So, moving on to the Excalibur arc, which was basically just a pointless filler arc, and yeah, it was the characters playing the game we'd seen before without any other stakes than wanting to play a game and get a cool weapon. I can't say it was that bad because there isn't much it did wrong, it was just boring because I had no reason to care. There was the continuing problem that the characters are taking this game far too seriously, really caring about the NPCs that the villains were killing despite them not being real. There's also the fact that the auto-generated quest being one that could threaten to destroy the world of the game is just a terrible idea to implement and especially to not have someone monitoring to, to stop it should it go too far. It felt like it was just being done to add stakes to something that otherwise would not matter at all. On the plus side, it was nice seeing the side characters actually do something to shine a little bit, but yeah, that's about all. Overall, mostly boring and pointless, not even worthy of a good rant. Then the Mother's Rosario arc. This arc I was skeptically optimistic going into because I heard a lot of people say it was the best part of season two and the best part of what has been adapted so far. And well, you know what? They were right. Mother's Rosario seemed to be where SAO was able to figure out how it can tell an interesting story going beyond the concept of being trapped in a video game that was wrapped up three arcs ago. The GGO arc did do that to some degree with Shane Yon and her friend, but I feel it didn't really succeed here because of how much it relied on the coolness of the virtual reality gaming to tell its story. But instead, the Mother's Rosario arc takes a step back and asks the question of what would a world that led to SAO end up having outside of video games? And then it tells a story in that world. Another thing it did here was take the focus away from Kirito, making Asuna the main character. The overall story of the arc is about a girl Asuna meets by the name of Yuki. She's a powerful player who's looking for someone strong enough to defeat her, saying that she will give a special sword skill to that person. Kirito steps up, tries to fight her, and is defeated. Asuna then steps up, tries to defeat her, and is also defeated. But Yuki ends up taking a liking to Asuna, and Yuki then takes Asuna to meet the rest of Yuki's guild, the Sleeping Knights. While the arc focused on Yuki here and her story, it also gave a lot of focus to Asuna and her family life. Like pretty much all the arcs, there are things that didn't make sense. Such as with Asuna being pushed to graduate school so early despite the fact that it would probably be impossible. Or some of the things in the games seeming to be impossible with the skill that is shown from the Sleeping Knights. That they really don't appear to be that great of players. The action in game was also rather flat and dull. I knew that the Sleeping Knights were going to win, and there was never any doubt or tension with that. I also never felt like I really got to know the other players in the Sleeping Knights beyond Yuki, which also kept the hype from being there because I did not have characters to care about. I also didn't get why Asuna and Yuki had such a strong bond despite only knowing each other a short time. But where the arc stood out is how it went beyond just their goal in game and battling monsters. One of the main conflicts of the arc is between Asuna and her mother. Her mother wants Asuna to not spend so much time playing video games and instead focus more on school and building a good life for herself. While Asuna wants her mother to understand her world of video games. And I feel this is a relatable conflict on both sides and I can really feel the hatred Asuna had for her mother based on some of the things that she did. Throughout this arc and her time with Yuki, Asuna became stronger and was able to stand up to her mother and basically mend their relationship so they could understand each other. And I thought this was really cool. Eventually, Asuna convinces her mother to come into game with her so she can see this world. And through their conversation, they were able to get each other and Asuna is able to both rebuke and sort of accept what her mother was saying. And that was really great. Moving on to Yuki... The approach to her was really different than any other characters we had seen. Typically, Kirito meets a girl, helps them out with their problems, and they are added to his harem. Instead, it's flipped. Not only was Asuna the one who got a girl added to her harem, but Asuna is the one who learned from this person she met. Though they do grow from each other as well. And I also really like Kirito in this arc. Yes, he is still as OP as ever, but because he is no longer the focus of the story, he can do cool things without taking away any of the tension. To bring up a kill-a-kill -kill analogy, Kirito is like Mako. Yes, I know this is weird. 
Just stick with me. Mako is a cool character and does so many things to help Ryoko along the way, and she shines in pretty much every scene she is in, gets numerous moments of awesome, and is just a lot of fun to watch. But she would be a terrible main character because she doesn't really learn or grow throughout the series. She is the one who helps Ryoko succeed and the other characters with their problems, but there is never any tension if Mako will succeed or not. But there doesn't have to be, because that's all on the main characters. And this is like Kirito during this arc. He does some really cool things, supports Asuna and Yuki, and he is still very uh, overpowered, but it doesn't take away from the conflicts. One of the things Kirito does here is using what he learned about video games to build Yuki a sort of robot she can use to go to school with Asuna. And it was neat seeing him practicing and learning all throughout the series and how he was able to use what he learned to help Yuki out here. Though the best part of the arc was Yuki's journey. We learn that she has a terminal sickness and is stuck in the hospital, about to die. In fact, she does die in episode 25. And in the end, she passes her sword skill down to Asuna, naming it Mother Rosario, which you recognize as the name of the arc. The arc is all about what Asuna learned from Yuki, the sword skill embodying that, and the legacy that Yuki left being Asuna, along with the many friends she met along the way. And her final moments, hundreds of fairies show up to send Yuki off, and I rewatched the scene to make this review, and it is one of the most emotional moments I have seen in a long time. I also love how SEO shows the power technology has here to bring people together. The characters in the Sleeping Nights are all those with terminal illness who are likely going to die soon, but they're able to come together because of games like this, live a life with each other they couldn't otherwise, which is like reality how the internet has brought people together. Most of my good friends are those who I met through the internet, and I've met several over the years who also have some sort of physical ailment that keeps them from living a life they would otherwise. But because they have the internet, because they have these games, they can still connect with people and have fun in ways they couldn't otherwise. I also found it cool how the technology that made SAO is now being used for medical treatment since this adds another layer to the science fiction world. It was even able to tie back into the original SAO villain's motivations, though I think we'll get that more explained in Season 3 based off what I've heard, which I am looking forward to Season 3 quite a lot. As a whole, the Mother's Rosario arc did have its rough parts and was plagued with some issues that the rest of SCO has, but what it does right, it really nails. Sword Art Online is one of the most unique anime out there, not because of its concept of being trapped in a video game or fantasy world, but because so much of the story is on the aftermath, the what happens next, the how do other characters in this broader world live. And that makes it really cool. And Mother Rosario arc is a perfect example of what this concept can allow. So, overall, Sword Art Online is a show that gets a lot of hate, but also a lot of praise. Both of these well deserved. It has its issues that will push some away, especially if you've seen a lot of what anime has to offer. But that doesn't mean it is worthless, and after liking Mother's Rosario plus an ordinal scale, I feel it's definitely something I can recommend, at least to some degree. And with the show getting better with each arc, or at least that's how it seems, I'm really excited for Season 3. So, I give Sword Art Online Season 2 a final score of a 6 out of 10, and the franchise as a whole the rating of worth checking out. For newer fans of anime, or even those seasoned watchers who can look past its flaws, I think you'll find something worthwhile here. Maybe some things you'll also question, but I think it's still worthwhile in the end. So thank you for watching this very long video that took me a while to make. Hopefully it'll be out sometime the same year I'm recording this. We'll have to see. Anyway, talk to you later. Thank you.